It is very interesting that uh, you see many kingdoms that have had so many kings. But for some reason, the Ngonis have had very few kings. Beyond the breathtaking cloud covered the Amkinzi Hills in Chipata in Eastern Zambia, not too far from Mpendukeni Palace of Paramount Chief Mpezeni, stands a museum housing part of the Ngonis of a 500 year old history. The single community museum at Fenwick Village was opened in 2017 as a repository of Ngoni history and culture. And in front stands a statue erected in honor of Prince Nsingo, often referred to as the uncrowned Ngoni king. Singo is known to have led what is referred to as the Ngoni Rebellion in 1897, when the British, searching for land and minerals, attempted to take away his father's kingdom. But that's only part of the story. In reality, white settlers played upon the actions of Nsingo and his followers to justify invading Pezeni's country, looting his wealth, and attempted to annihilate his entire bloodline. According to oral and recorded history, towards the end of 1897, unknown to his father the king, single crown prince of the Angoni people led a revolt against British settlers in one of the most daring and organized military campaigns by indigenous Africans ever staged in northern Rhodesia during colonial times. The attack, which began with laying siege to North Chartered Exploration Company NCEC at Fort Young, soon Singo and his men encircled Kao Wise and a group of Europeans stationed at Laungeni. Despite being armed with guns, the Europeans were greatly outnumbered and had no escape. Singo and his men taunted their victims by striking their long shields and hitting the ground so that the sound of their bells echoed across the region. So this is how it all started, but now let's look at how it ended. By January 1898, more than 650 British troops equipped with rations, field guns and maxims were in Pezeni's territory led by Captain Brake. The Angoni themselves were a warrior state with a big reputation for bravery. Initially, pockets of success were recorded by the Angonis, but this was short-lived. Reinforcements and heavy artillery by the British soon proved a decisive factor in the war. Singles forces fought bravely, but as their losses increased, the lines halted and then began to retire slowly. From 23rd January, Captain Brake commenced mopping up operation. And on January 24th, Brake received envoys from Pezeni informing him that the king was wary of the war and prayed for peace, placing himself entirely in Brake's hands to impose whatever conditions he thought fit, and to ask for British flags to be hoisted over the king's crow. Captain Brake agreed to go to the king's crow the next morning. However, when the troops reached Chimpingo, Pezeni's crow, it was found deserted. And so the village was burnt and the forces made for the hills in search of Mpezeni. During the skirmishes which followed, Yakufu, one of Mpezeni's sons, was killed on the 30th of January. Singo, the leader of the so-called rebellion, was equally captured by Lieutenant Brogdon. He was brought back to the Crow and after trial by drumhead court-martial, was summarily executed on 5th February 1898, apparently tied to a Mubanga tree and killed by firing squad. Soon afterwards, Putra, his wife, was killed by a mobile column under the command of Lieutenant Paul. It is also alleged that in an attempt to kill Nsingo's brother Madzimawe, whose identity was not clearly established, all the young men in the village were slaughtered. In the end, Singo's 11-year-old son was installed as Mpezeni II and was taken to Fort Jemson, where his name was changed from Chiloa to Gabriel and introduced to Catholicism. Back in Pezeni's country, all youth regiments were banned, as was the mention of Nsingo's name. So now the question is, could the Nsingo's attack on Wise and about 40 other Europeans at Fort Young justify the decimation of an entire dynasty? Who was Carl Wise, and why was it so necessary to get rid of Mpezeni and his lineage? 
According to oral history, before the BSSC gained control of northeastern Rhodesia, Karl Weiss, a German adventurer, had already secured for himself a number of concessions from African chiefs in the area, one of whom was the Ngoni paramount chief Mpezeni, with whom Weiss had friendly relations. 65,000 square kilometers on both sides of the Anglo-Portuguese boundary is what Wise claimed to have owned on account of the Convention of 1891. Clearly, Wise was a king in Africa, and both Portuguese and British agents sought his favor to gain a foothold, especially in Pezeni's resource-rich territory. Wise chose the Portuguese, resulting in Pezeni rejecting British treaties from both Thompson and Sharp. Sir Harry Johnston, His Majesty's Commissioner and Council General for the Territories under British influence north of the Zambezi, was determined to prevent the Portuguese from establishing themselves in northeastern Rhodesia and sent Sharp back to Bezeni with a simple mission buy wise and make a treaty with the chief. Sharp failed again and returned to Nyasaland in May 1890. At this point, Johnston had labeled Wise a slave trader and an utterly unscrupulous man. Nevertheless, in May 1891, Northern Rhodesia was proclaimed a territory within the British sphere of influence. However, a settlement with Wise over his claims to massive land in the area had to be reached. With his claims conflicting with the BSAC and rejected by Johnston, Wise took his claims to the Foreign Office, hoping it would overrule Johnston's decision. Ironically, the office could neither recognize nor reject Wise's concessions, but instead wrote to Johnston strongly suggesting that the BSAC reach some form of agreement with Wise, as they could only recognize concessions in British territory granted to a chartered company. At the beginning of 1894, Wise sold his concessions for £1,500 to the Mozambique Gold Land and Concessions Company Limited, a body conveniently incorporated in February 1893 by a firm in London. Soon after that, control of the firm was acquired by Oceana Company, which held mining properties throughout South and Central Africa. Having vested interests, Johnston is said to have coerced the Oceana Company's willingness to negotiate with the BSAC by threatening to reopen the issue of validity of the concessions. Thus, to avoid further investigations, the two companies came to an agreement where the BSAC took over Wise's concessions and granted the Mozambique Gold Land and Concessions Company Limited an area of 10,000 square miles situated in the East Mwangwa district. It was then that it was further decided that the new company, the North Chartered Exploration Company, be formed to manage the grant. Meanwhile, while the Europeans were sharing the lands of Africa, the Africans in the area were desperately trying to secure their native home. The history of the NCEC for the first few years of existence was marked by continual friction with Mpezeni and the BSAC. And in August 1895, Colonel Wharton was appointed by the NCEC as administrator and general manager for the North Charterland Concession. Soon after assuming office, Wharton, in the company of Wise and a group of 14 Europeans, visited Mpezeni. Initially, Mpezeni received the group in a friendly manner. However, when he realized that Wharton's intentions were to impose a tax on his people and to control slave trade activities in the area, Pezeni was less welcome. To be sure, Pezeni cautiously tolerated the trekking of white settlers in Angoni territory, no doubt wanting a peaceful Angoni land, even if it meant coexisting with those normally considered to be the enemy. One European that especially won favor with King Pezeni was legendary British soldier Major G. R. D. who visited Pezeni in 1897, claiming he had lived in Zululand for at least three years. But the king's son, Crown Prince Nsingo, was less accommodating to foreign influences. Nsingo, whose name meant sharp as a razor, seemed to have only one policy for European invaders in Ngoni land zero tolerance. In the mid-1800s, Pezeni began losing grip on power, with some of his indunas accusing him of being a weak leader for entertaining the white men. 
More and more Angonis had begun looking to Nsingo as the only remaining savior who would reclaim their former glory and reputation as a proud and brave kingdom that feared and submitted to no one. Secretly, many of the Angoni warriors, and especially the Impis, started inciting Singo to take decisive action against the Europeans, branding him an inspirational war general and began taking orders only from him. Thus, when it became apparent that Wotan's intentions were to subdue and tax the Angoni, and that the British were equally using cowboys to amass their presence in Ngoni land, Singo decided that enough was enough. At the command of Nsingo, three long lines of Angoni soldiers were deployed in Zulu-inspired cow-horn formation and encircled the British forces at Fort Young. Instinctively, Wise sent word to Nyasaland that Fort Young was under siege and that he needed backup. When news reached Fort Jemsen, Colonel W.H. Manning, His Majesty's Acting Commissioner and Council General of British Central Africa, immediately offered to send in troops to aid Wise and his men. As previously mentioned, it was shortly afterwards that Captain Brake arrived with his death squad and by 9th February, the so-called rebellion was practically over. In retrospect, many historians insist that the actions of Nsingu and a few of his men were not tantamount to Angoni rebellion, that the incident in Pezeni's land was exaggerated by Europeans in order to get rid of Mpezeni and his lineage, that in fact, there never was Angoni rebellion. Wise's report and call for reinforcement was not necessary as at that time of the year, the Ngoni gathered at Mbezeni's crow to celebrate the first fruit ceremony called Mutwala. But Wise and company described the gathering coupled with Nsingo's attack as the Ngoni preparing for war. Based on this assumption, Manning the acting commissioner ordered the invasion of Mbezeni's country, arguing that the time had come now to crush the Ngoni once and for all. To be sure, invasion of Ngoni land offered many benefits. After the war, at least half of over 24,000 head of cattle believed to have been owned by the Ngoni prior to 1898 were taken by Brick's forces and disposed of in the personal interest of the British Central Administration officers engaged in the mission. Most of the loot of cattle was sold for profit in southern Rhodesia and Nyasa land, enabling the BSAC to derive a considerable profit from the so-called rebellion after covering all expenses. Brake, who led the British forces, stated that the Ngoni were taken completely by surprise and easily defeated. That it was evident that the Ngoni had not rebelled and were not prepared for war. Furthermore, it is ironic that it was Major Deer, Pezeni's fondest European friend, who, though refusing to actively participate in the invasion, that provided BCA troops with all the information they needed at Kota Kota to invade Pezeni's country. His only request was that his old friend Pezeni be treated well. And so it was that when all was said and done, Pezeni was banished to the newly founded Fort Mani and after a while reinstated in the chieftainship, eventually dying in October 1900. But his lineage would never be the same again. Something which is very interesting that uh, you see many kingdoms that have had so many kings, but for some reason, Lingonis have had very few kings. <laughs>